This is the SFNSF podcast for August 2016. Recorded live at the American Bookbinders Museum, SFNSF is Science Fiction in San Francisco, a monthly series of author readings from the science fiction, fantasy, horror, and genre literary fields, hosted by Terry Bisson. And now, the coordinator of SFNSF, Rena Weissman. And welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, first of all, you notice that you are in this amazing, amazing space. So the, f the first order of business is to introduce Madeline Robbins, who runs this remarkable American Bookbinders Museum. Hi, I'm Madeline Robbins. I am not remarkable, but this yes. is the American Bookbinders Museum, and it is kind of remarkable. We are the only museum of bookbinding in the continental United States. I think the only other one in the world is in Turkey. So right at the moment, we're your best option. And um, we celebrate and look at the shift from artisanal bookbinding to mechanical bookbinding and everything that goes with it, including the rise of unionism and all sorts of other cool stuff. We are open to the public Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 4. Please come visit. And we are, as always, delighted to have you guys here. Thank you. <laughs> Lots of wires here, don't trip. So. Um, just to let you folks know about a few upcoming events that SF and SF will be sponsoring. Uh, in September, we will have a literally a literary legend appearing with us, and that is author Robert Silverberg in conversation with Terry Bisson, our moderator, and his co-author on this new book called Conversations. It's basically a look back at his career and his writing, um, Alvaro Zinos Amaro, and we also are lucky enough we will have the book's publisher Patrick Swenson with Fairwoods Press here as well. We do anticipate that this will be a sold out event. I will be having a link uh, sent through our mailing list and posted up on our website where you can pre-order tickets through Brown Bag and that all will get rolling in the next week or so. Um, if you're not on our mailing list yet, you can sign up right at the front of the room here on our list. You get a couple emails a month, but it does tell you everything that's going on with us. Then in October, we are delighted to welcome back uh, a fabulous YA author, Garth Nix, who will be here on his last, the last leg of his literally international tour, because he lives in Australia, so we don't get to see him very often. And a local author who had a huge hit with a book called The Gollum and the Ginny, uh, Helene Wecker, and that will be October 16th. Uh, then in November, we will be welcoming on November 13th, author Rick Wilbur, and local author Nick Mamatas with oh. I Am Providence. And I regret to say, I forget the name of Rick's book, Alien Something, but it is sure to be wonderful, so please come. Rick's a great author, great guy, so I know you'll enjoy that event as well. Uh, the last thing I wanted to address tonight is that we were supposed to have another author join us, David D. Levine, who has a new book out from Tor with a fabulous cover, and the book is called Arabella of Mars. So I just wanted to give a little shout out to this as well. He was very disappointed he couldn't be here, but uh, reasons. Uh, just a couple, couple little clips that uh, describe this book. Interplanetary pirates, imperiled inheritances, disguises, rebellion, romance. Arabella of Mars is a blast, a smart, resourceful heroine, a nonstop adventure-packed, thoroughly engaging debut from Kurt Busiek, an Eisner Award-winning author. And Arabella of Mars is the delicious love child of Jane Austen, Patrick O'Brien, and Jules Verne from Mary Jo Putney. So I think if you like that kind of thing, and who doesn't, uh, a resourceful heroine of Mars, who can, who could beat that? So I advise you to check it out. Um, we will have some copies for sale here, courtesy of Borderlands Books, our bookseller for the event. So again, David, we're sorry you're not here. Uh, he will be at Worldcon if you guys want to see him there if you're going, but otherwise, just another great book in literary genre fiction to pick up. So without further ado, I'm going to turn our evening over and abdicate all responsibility for anything to Terry Bisson, our moderator. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
So we're competing with a ghost, right? We should just hang it up. I mean. We can take him. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I uh, want to remind everybody to turn on your cell phones in case a better offer comes along. <laughs> and tonight, uh, it's kind of interesting for me. Actually, um, I don't know either of these authors, and they're both quite acclaimed and well-established in the Y field, which, as we know, is gobbling up science fiction um, quite readily. And uh, so I'm looking very much forward to this. And um, so without further ado, our first reader, uh, as you know, we have uh, both of our authors will read, and then we will have a short break, which everybody will get a little bit drunk, and then we will come back and we'll have a discussion. So, I'd like to begin. Our first author, our first book was called, what's the name of it? Boy, boy Proof. Proof. You don't look boy proof to me, but <laughs> it may have not have been a memoir. Um, <laughs> she's also a, uh, one of the founders of the LA Review of Books. Do you still do that? No. So they kicked you out? Or? No, I left. <laughs> oh, you left, okay. And uh, she has a history in improv, and she's also a uh, history in rock and roll. She was a member of Bike and Nerdy Girl. We all remember Nerdy Girl, I would hope. And so without further ado, to um, our begin our reading series tonight, Cecil. I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm going to read a short story that came out on Tor.com, um, and it's actually the sort of origin story of one of the aliens from my duology, Tin Star and Stone in the Sky. And I figured that that you know, uh, is better than reading from a novel where it's just sort of in the middle. This is a complete story. So, um, so this alien, Hecklek, is a, 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 he is a big part of Tula Bane's adventure on this space station, or her survival on this space station. Um, and he is sort of an in, in, in insect kind of uh, alien. So uh, it's called The Sound of Useless Wings. And I'm just going to start. I try to ignore my brothers and sisters as I do my work under the hot twin suns. They call me names. They call me dreamer. They call me innocent. They call me ridiculous. All the while, I herd the rodents into the pen. I collect animal droppings and scatter them in the garden. I chew what long grass I can find and spit it out into the bucket so my mother can make the doughy bread that is a staple of the hort diet. When I'm done with my chores, I look up at the sky. I have long looked up at the sky and the thought of possibilities. Hecklek, my mother screams when she catches me studying or staring at the landscape. Get back in from the field with your brothers and sisters. My brothers and sisters are identical to me. We come from the same brood. After chores, they always push past me with their heavy bodies. As I dream, they get to the table first. They feed and fill themselves, and when I finally tear myself away from the night stars and make my way inside, I always find that there is little left for me to eat. As a result, I have grown up small for my kind. Every time my family and I go to town to trade, the aliens who visit our planet catch my attention. The purr with their four long arms and thinness, the lure with their antennae and impossible, impossibly straight posture, the brahar, the nurlock, the gedge. There are so many kinds. I cannot stop looking at them. They are so strange. My brothers and sisters don't look at the species that they think hold the hort back, but I stare. On my planet, Patra, there is a crisis. We see it on the vid screens. We see it in the papers. We see it plastered on the walls. We are once again overpopulated, and some of us must leave. The League of Worlds has finally given us a planet to populate. There have been six exoduses before this one. We watch to see which brood numbers are called up to leave home. My brothers and sisters hope our number is not called. I feel differently about leaving here than they do. When our number is called, I rejoice. The other hort in my lottery take to the streets and riot in one last explosion of revelry and revolt, but it will change nothing. We are leaving this planet. We are going somewhere else. I march with my brothers and sisters. We march in rows of eight. The twin suns beat down upon us. The dust kicks up. We are leaving this planet in waves. 
Our parents shout in grief along with the others as they watch us parade by. One of my brothers starts to rub his little useless wings together and music fills the air. Soon, others all join in. Wing music calms all fears. I do not rub my wings. I never do. I do not want to numb myself to life. I march toward the ship, but I am out of step with the others. I'm walking faster. I'm walking toward my future. Stay in line, Hecklek, my sister hisses as she rubs, the music flowing from her back. They are afraid. They do not want to go, but I am glad. I was meant to leave my planet. I was meant for adventure. I was meant for the stars. Why must we go, my brother Jenkel asks as we strap in. The officers, space weary, show us all how to work the complicated restraints. I understand it right away and help my brothers and sisters. Jenkel has the hardest time of it. He nips at me as I help him, and he is always the first to push me. Everything I do makes him hate me. Once settled in their seats, my brothers and sisters can no longer rub their wings for comfort as we blast off. They open their mouths and yell. Some pass out. I stare out of the window and watch my home planet fall away. It is yellow, impossibly yellow, and then it becomes smaller and smaller until I can no longer tell it from another star in the sky. It's beautiful, a voice near me says. I turn my head in my harness and see her, the most beautiful hort I've ever seen. Her skin slicked olive, moist and hard, her exoskeleton strong and muscled, her black eyes wide with wonder. Once we are in deep space, when we undo our harnesses and are able to wander the ship, I seek her out. As the others complain, she and I talk. Her name is Goglu, and she hails from the capital city. She is the daughter of a politician and grew up far away from the famine and the dust. Her family is small, and I envy her that she does not know the burden of a mother who bore so many broods. You could have stayed, I say. Politicians are known to help keep their kin if their brood number is called. Why would I when there's so much more to see than Patra and so, much more, so many more species than Hort? I do what any Hort would do. When we are alone in a storage locker away from the other's eyes, I pull my wing and open my back plate and I show her my tiny beating heart. I am in love. It's so small, she says. It will grow, I say. When we arrive at our new home, it is shocking to see only one sun in the sky. The first days, the gravity weighs heavy on us. Mostly, we can only sleep. Once we are able to move and the world stops spinning, we are assigned roles. Goglu is a leader while I labor. She is out of my league. Once again, my brothers and sisters laugh at me. How is it that we are of the same brood, and yet my brain seems to see the whole galaxy differently than they do? I see the possibilities, the lines that lead from here to there, the threads that you can pull to get this or that. I can see the future like a map. I can see the moves needed to get there. You're just a drone, my brothers and sisters yell. She could be a queen. It certainly seems that Goglu is destined for a higher purpose than I am on our new planet, but I can see a path that leads to her. I can count the moves that it will take. If I want to be with her, I will have to be cunning. I will have to woo her like all the other court of a certain status. I know what to do. I start small, trading my spitting services, or by collecting the maggots that this planet has in abundance, which are so sweet to my kind. I trade favors with my brothers and sisters. I do their work. I become stronger. I learn quickly. I deal with the aliens who no one else wants to mingle with when they visit our planet to check on us or negotiate. I curry favor. I save until I have enough for trinkets and foodstuffs. I save until I have enough to move along and to pay for status when the time comes. I save until I can go to the town center and sing the songs of companionship. And all the while, I think I see signs of encouragement from Goglu. After all, doesn't she look at me longer than the others? Doesn't she bring me water when I finish running from the fields to town? Doesn't she tell the powerful Hort that I am to be trusted to trade with? There is no other Hort for her. Her black eyes glisten, and while she has never lifted her wing and back plate to show me the size of her heart, I know that her heart must be mine. The next step is harder. I have to work on a nest so that when I ask her to mate with me, she will have a place to birth a brood. Making a nest releases the hormones I need to spin my code, and it is the only way to get my heart to grow bigger. I climb high on the mountain behind the house where I live with my brothers and sisters. In the high ground, I find a cave where the sky invites wonder. I begin the laborious process of spinning my code into a small ball. When my ball is done, I think of how amazing it is that soon I will hold my DNA in my mouth. 
Goglu's encouragement has stimulated my transition from youth to adult. My brothers and sisters sense that I'm up to something and they won't leave me alone. What are you doing, brother? They ask one by one. Leave me alone, I say. It is not their business. I hardly know them. I make my way up the path to my cave and I'm full of hopes and dreams and I'm full with the thoughts of the future. What are you doing? Jenkel asks at the entrance of the cave. He has followed me. It is surprising. I've never known a brother or sister to stray from one another. That is my quirk. Usually they run in a pack. We Hort generally do not like to be alone. Jenkel pushes past my small stature into the cave and sees the nest. In it, he sees all the treasures I've accumulated with my trading, and he sees my ambition. His eyes flash, and I see something in my brother Jenkel that I've never seen before. Jealousy. He turns as though I am poisoned with something terrible and scrambles back down the mountain, and now he knows my secret. The rest of our siblings take no notice, and I wonder which one of us, he or I, will make the first move. The horns finally sound, and it is the day of declaration for all young courts to find a mate. My siblings do not care about the declaration. They are still in their primary stage, and I have already shed my first skin, and their hearts have not turned or grown as mine has. I rub my new skin as best I can with oils, and I gather my code in my mouth, and I head toward town, and I leave them behind. The roads on this planet are not dusty. They are green with foliage that in a few generations will be gone. We will eat this planet raw. Still, I am halfway to town when I hear the noise behind me. I turn and I see Jenkel. I should have noticed that he was oiled up too. I noticed that he too has shed his first skin. I should have realized that it was not just my heart that had matured. He comes around and stands in front of me, blocking the road. I push forward, but Jenkel stands in my way. He is so strong, so big, and I am so thin and weak. Why, in my youth, had I spent so much time looking up instead of eating? Why had I spent so much time bartering with aliens or in my cave instead of laboring in the field to develop muscles and strength? Why had I spent so much time cultivating my mind when I knew from my studies that the fit usually win in fights? He could take me down easily with one swing of his appendage. I look at my brother, questioning him with my eyes. I cannot open my mouth or I will lose my ball of code. I only see hatred in him. He hates me. He has always hated me. They all have. He shoves me off the road and pins me to a tree in a way that crushes my back. He flips me over with ease and then I feel him lift up my little wing and pry open my back plate. I imagine that he wants to confirm that my heart has grown. I do not imagine that he will stab me there, but he does. He stabs my heart with his tongue. He stabs and stabs until I cannot breathe. He stabs until I can do nothing but cry and spit out my piece of code. It rolls out onto the ground, and when it does, Jenkel lets me go, and I collapse. I watch as he scuttles to it and licks it clean, and that's when I see it. How had I never seen this in Jenkel? When he flaps his wings, one of them unfolds awkwardly, and I see now that his wing is deformed in such a way that I know his heart could never grow. He would never be able to spin his own code. He steals one last look at me and puts my code into his own mouth. I know what he will do. He will present my code. He will show my nest, and no one will know any differently because our DNA is the same. We are brood brothers, after all. I push myself up off the ground. I'm most likely dying, but I take some leaves from the tree that shades me and stuff them under my back plate. I hope that this will hold enough of my heart together so that it will keep beating. I get to my feet, and I drag myself to town. I watch, exhausted and hidden in the back, as Jenkel presents my ball of code to a female that I do not know. I watch in pain as Goglu scans the crowd. I hope she is searching for me. I shrink into the shadows. It will take me too long to grow my heart again, even if I can, even if I live. It is her time, and she has declared, and she must choose now. And I watch in despair as she picks a mate who is not me. Her face betrays no disappointment. She is too excited by the ceremony. And then I wonder if she ever really had a heart. All of my dreams and my plots and my plans are shattered. The crowd pushes by me, ready to celebrate, and they feel joy. The couples will go to their nests and exchange their codes. Broods will come in 240 days, and I do not want to be here. I start to head out of town, but I realize I cannot go home. I wander aimlessly. I enter an alien bar, and I imbibe. I make a few trades, but with no purpose, and I watch as the lone sun rises, and I realize I do not want to be here. There is only one place to go, the stars. I drag myself to the spaceport and try to find a ship, any ship. Where are you going, a purse says to me. I'm looking for workers. 
Then she notices the blood. You look injured, she says. I lift up my wing and show her how the blood is staunched. The purr nods. She knows Hort well enough to know that to be stabbed in a heart is to never be able to spin coat again. She knows I am disgraced and that I cannot stay here with any dignity. She knows I must run. She must have run at some point herself because instead of shooing me away, she motions me toward her. We have a med bay on board. Report there first, she says. I make my way onto the ship and am patched up and injected with nanites. Aliens of all kinds are there, Nurlock with their tiny babies, human wanderers with their strange tattoos and their voices that hurt my senses. There are Pranko and Letes and Zoko and others I cannot name. Where are we heading? I ask the others as we leave. The other aliens shrug. For years I travel. For years I collect things from each place I go. I work hard migrating from planet to planet, but every time I see a hort, I check my heart, still small, and avoid them from shame. My heart never grows in size again, and I can never go back and join my people. To be hort is to breed, and I can never do that. Years rush by, and I've seen a hundred planets and a score of ships. This one is Brahar, the captain closer to a pirate than a traitor, not that it matters. I have hurt, and I have killed, and I have stolen, and I have plundered. I have blood on my soul that will not wash away. The ship approaches a space station, and I watch it grow as we swing past the planet. I know that we all look like stars in the sky, and the planet below is rumored to be full of ore, and many think that riches are to be made. But for some reason this time I'm restless to leave the ship, and I step on the docking bay, and I see desperate aliens begging for work or for a ride down to the planet below. Do me a favor, a nurlock pulls on my appendage. Hold my spot while I go run an errand. What, you, what will you give me for it, I ask. A favor, she says. I nod and take the Nurlock space in line, and then a crazed Brahar comes to me and asks me to hold a package, as I am his last hope and everyone else has shooed him away, and I gain a currency chit, which I trade for a piece of space-worthy fabric, which I trade for an expensive bottle of water, which I trade and I trade and I trade and I trade, and I go back onto the ship only to get my bag in order to trade more. By the, cap by the time the captain comes back to the ship to depart for the planet, I've increased my wealth a thousandfold and I feel calmer than I have in years of moving from planet to planet and from ship to ship. All aboard, the captain says, and my mates rush to board, but I stay in place. My traveling has made me hungry for home. By doing these small favors for the desperate, I feel less desperate myself. These small, useless favors have me feeling like my young self. And after all, it has been years since I have been on the run. I'm too tired to move anymore, too tired for cruelty. Leave me on the station, I say to the captain. Once we leave, and I go to the planet, we won't come back to get you. You'll be on your own. I nod. I calculate the odds for my new future. One week, one month, one year, five years, ten. The future looks interesting, more interesting than the darkness of travel. I hear you have a timer. I can trade you that timer for a bin in the gutter, Gedge pulls at my appendage to get my attention. I look at the captain. I look at the Gedge. I make a choice. I nod at the Gedge and hand him the timer for my bag. Goodbye, captain, I say. The captain shakes his head and boards the ship, which leaves without me. My life aboard this space station begins, but as the docking bay closes, I feel a pain. It is my heart. It flutters. I swear it grows. And for the first time in my life, I rub my little useless wings for comfort. Tor.com, the only venue in science fiction that deals with explicit sex. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's move on. Our next reader, Van Laurie, was also a musician. He played mandolin and baritone saxophone wow. in one of those ordinary bluegrassy type bands called Soda and His Million Peace Bands. He has a kind of an interesting um, history, like Ted Chang. He's been published in The New Yorker. Um, his first book, and I think you've only got two or three out now, right? Just two. One's Just a picture two. book. OK. It's called Stories for Nighttime and Some for the Day. And I believe you're going to read one of these tonight. Is that correct? Or you're Oh, well, they're very short, so I was going to read a couple, I think. All right. Well, let's, let's do with it, and then we'll talk later. All right. <laughs> ben Laurie. Hey, 
Can you hear me? Does, does this, oh, I can hear myself. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so these stories are pretty short, so I'm gonna read a couple. The first one is called The Rock Eater. These are some new stories. Um, I write a lot of stories about rocks. When I was little, I read Sylvester and the Magic Pebble. Has anyone read that? So it just got in really deep, and now, like, I'd say, whenever I sit down to write a story, there's like a one in 10 chance it's gonna be <laughs> about a rock. So this is one of my rock stories. The Rock Eater. <laughs> there once was a man who ate a rock. It was a small rock, nothing big. The man found it in a field, and it was pretty, very pretty, and so he picked it up and he ate it. He wasn't in the habit of doing things like that. It surprised him as much as anyone. But there it was on that day, just lying in the field, the rock, the pretty rock, and so he ate it. The man felt great after he did it. It made him happy to have the rock inside him. And it wasn't just the physical sensation of the rock, it was also something else. Somehow the man felt the rock made him better. Somehow he felt it improved him. It gave him a lift, more self-confidence. Somehow it positively changed him. And the man was very, very happy about it. And then he told his wife. You did what, said his wife? You ate a rock? The man explained to her how it had happened. That's insane, said his wife. You're lucky you're not dead. It was just a rock, said the man. It was hardly going to kill me. But after that, the man started to worry. He wandered around thinking about the rock. Should he not have eaten it? Could it really have done him harm? And what's more, could it really do him harm? He needed to talk to someone about it, but he was afraid all his friends would laugh. So he went downtown and wandered around and knocked on the door of the doctor. How big was this rock, the doctor said. The man held up his hands to indicate the size. About this big, he said, pretty small. Hmm, said the doctor and frowned. What do you mean, hmm, the man said. Is it dangerous? Well, I wouldn't say dangerous, the doctor said. It's just, you know, rocks can grow. <laughs> grow, the man said. He'd never heard of that. Grow, said the doctor, when you eat them, that is. Why, I once saw a woman with an 80-pound boulder in her gut. He shook his head. It wasn't pretty, he said. The man stared at the doctor. So what do I do, he finally said. It should probably come out, the doctor said. Out, said the man. You mean surgery? Do you really think that's necessary, he said. The decision is yours, of course, said the doctor. But personally, I would recommend it. The man went home and thought about it. He told his wife what the doctor had said. You should never have eaten that rock to begin with. What did you expect, she said. That night, the man lay thinking about the rock. He could still feel it there inside him. He could still feel its goodness radiating through him. I don't want to lose the rock, he said. Some time went by. The doctor called. I think I will keep the rock, the man said. Are you sure, said the doctor. Pretty sure, said the man. Well, said the doctor, it's your decision. If you ever change your mind, though, let me know. OK, said the man, and that was that. More time went by. The man was happy. The rock felt good inside him. But there was one thing that was bothering the man. The rock was definitely growing. The man's stomach was getting bigger and bigger. It was starting to stick out. And the rock was getting heavier, too. The man was having a hard time standing up. And finally, one day, it got to the point where the man couldn't get out of bed. So what, said his wife, you're just going to lie there? I can't move, said the man. What do you want? This is all because of that dumb rock, his wife said. You should just get it cut out already. I don't want it cut out, the man said. It's my rock. It's my rock. I ate it. It makes me happy. Then the pain set in. The rock had grown so big it was crowding out the man's innards. You have to do it now, the man's wife said. You understand you'll die if this keeps up. The man knew that his wife was right. He could feel the rock filling up his body. 
He could still feel the goodness of it in there somewhere, but it was buried now beneath the pain and fear. All right, the man said, go get the doctor. Finally, his wife said, and she did. The surgery was hard. The doctor needed four men just to lift the rock out. They placed it on a scale, but the scale was crushed and the weight of the rock was never recorded. Otherwise, everything went according to plan. They sewed the man's stomach back up. The doctor pronounced the procedure a success and had a cigar on the porch. Time went by as the man recuperated. Then one day he woke up feeling fine. He patted his stomach and got out of bed, took a breath and headed toward the door. Where are you going? The man's wife said. For a walk, said the man. I feel great. The man went out and walked and walked. It was a nice day and he felt the breeze and saw the clouds and heard the birds and everything was absolutely wonderful. But after a while, the man started to feel different. He started to feel like something was wrong. He frowned and frowned, trying to figure it out. And then it hit him. It was the rock. The rock was gone. That was why he felt so hollow inside. There was a great big hole inside him. And the man wiped his brow and squinted and squirmed. And then the bad feeling got worse. In a panic, the man turned and ran to the field where he'd found the rock on that day so long ago. He looked around, all around, on the ground, everywhere, staring down, walking around in circles. Another rock will make me feel good again, he thought. Another rock will be just what I need. But he couldn't seem to find another rock like his. None of them looked right to him. Oh, there were lots of other rocks, of course, but they were dull and brown and covered with dirt. None of them looked like the right one for him. He ate some anyway, but they didn't work. What am I going to do, the man said. How am I supposed to live like this? And then it hit him, and he stopped and spun around. My rock, where's my rock, he said. The man ran frantically all the way home. Where is the rock, he screamed. What rock, said his wife. The rock, screamed the man. The rock, the rock, my rock. Oh, said his wife, it's out back. It was too heavy to carry very far. The man went out back. There it was, the rock, over in the corner of the yard. The man ran to it. He knelt down beside it. He wrapped his arms around the stone. He ran his hands all over its surface. He rubbed his face against it. It was way too big for him to eat, of course, but he held it, pressed it to his chest. Oh, rock, he said, how could I have been so stupid? And how can I get this empty feeling out? And then the man heard a noise and the rock cracked open and he stared into its dark and hungry mouth. <laughs> Um, okay, this is called De Death and the Lady. A lady goes to church one Sunday morning and notices Death sitting beside her in the pew. Oh, Death, she says, very much surprised. Why, hello, I didn't see you. Hello to you too, miss, Death says with a smile. And what are we praying for today? Oh, says the lady, long life and happiness. Ah, says Death, sounds nice. When the service is over, the lady gets up to leave. I'll see you later, Death, she says. Indeed, says Death, I certainly hope so. And he smiles and watches her walk away. The next week, the lady returns to church, and Death is sitting there again. Afternoon, miss, he says with a smile. If you don't mind, she says, I'm actually a ma'am. Oh, says Death. He looks a bit surprised. I know, isn't it strange, the lady says. She raises her hand and wiggles her wedding ring. Well, says Death, lucky man. Are you all right, the lady says after a moment. You're looking a little pale, you know. <laughs> working hard, says Death. Just working hard is all. Well, let's get some lunch, the lady says. But, says Death, motioning to the service. Oh, don't worry about that, the lady says. She rises from the pew and motions for Death to follow. They have those all the time, she says. The lady takes Death to a nearby cafe. 
They sit at a table and eat bread and sausage. Feel better, says the lady. Oh, yes, says Death. In fact, I do very much. For a moment, the two of them just sit there and smile. Do you have any children, the lady says. Oh, no, says Death. Marriage is not for me. My career has to come first, you know. I understand, the lady says, with her best understanding nod. I have a cousin like that. Wait, I think I have a picture in here. She rummages around in her purse. That's my husband, she says, passing Death a photo. And that's my sister and my cousin. And that's my daughter, and those are the twins. Handsome boys, says Death, you must be proud. Just then a bell tolls in the distance. Goodness, says the lady, I have to go. We're having a dinner party tonight, and I still have so much to do. Quite all right, says Death. I hope it goes well. And don't worry, I'll get the bill. Are you sure, says the lady? I had a wonderful time. Absolutely, says Death, I did too. The next week, the lady arrives at church to find Death sitting out front in a convertible. I thought we might go for a drive, he says. After all, the weather's beautiful. What a marvelous idea, the lady says, climbing in. Is this yours, she says, the car? Oh, no, says Death. I took a vow of poverty. My uncle let me borrow it for the day. Ah, says the lady. That's very nice of him. Well, on with it, Jeeves. Let's go. And Death laughs and puts the car into gear. And onward, the two of them roll. Death drives the lady up into the hills that stand overlooking the city. They park by a cliff and spread out a blanket and open up Death's picnic basket. They unpack a feast and lay it all out, and then they drink a toast. To you, says Death. No, you, says the lady. Well then, says Death, to us both. The two lie on the blanket and laugh and talk. Death tells the lady about his job. It's OK, he says, but sometimes I get lonely. I know how you feel, the lady says. You do, says Death. I always thought you were happy, dinner parties and photographs and all. Well, says the lady, things are different now. What with everyone gone? Gone, says Death, but where did they go? Well, my husband, you know, the lady says. My daughter's married and in Sweden now, and the twins have moved to Maine. I don't understand, Death says. Last week they were four. Oh, Death, says the lady, that wasn't last week. Maybe time moves differently for you, but I haven't seen you in years. But, says Death, gazing at her in awe, but you look exactly the same. But even as he says that, he sees the old woman like a ghost there moving beneath the skin. Well, says Death, he blinks and looks away. You look the same to me, he says. It's nice of you to say, the lady says with a smile, and I still feel the same on most days. And what have you been up to, she suddenly says brightly, as if to change the subject. Me, says Death, oh, well, not too much, running up and down upon the earth. Well, tell me about it, the lady says. I've never been anywhere in my life. Nowhere, says Death. Just here, the lady says, is the rest of the world is nice. Nice, Death says. I never thought of it that way. I like it best in Asia, I guess. Did you see the Great Wall of China, the lady says? Oh, yes, says Death, of course. So he tells her about his time there, about the houses and the domes, about the sunsets and the spires. And he tells her about Egypt and Iceland and Norway and Antarctica and everywhere else. It all sounds so nice, the lady says with a sigh. I always meant to see the world, but there wasn't time. Well, says Death, it's never too late. In fact, if you want. You can drive. He raises a hand and motions to the car. Oh, I couldn't, the lady says. I never even got a driver's license. I won't tell if you won't, Death says. The lady looks at Death, and Death looks back. And then, with a smile, she starts to nod. All right, she says, you got yourself a deal. Now, if you please, help a lady up. So Death stands up and takes the lady's arm, and he walks her slowly to the car. He helps her in and then climbs in himself. She turns the key, and the engine roars. OK now, says Death. 
Are you sure you want to do this? I do, the lady says, but first a kiss. So Death leans in and they close their eyes and they kiss and the car rolls off the cliff. <laughs> How long has it been? Is there time for another one? No, has do it. it. Like an, okay, all right. So this is a story that's in the Invaders anthology that's out now from Tachyon. Okay. It's, it's, it's called, yeah. It's called The Squid Who Fell in Love with the Sun. <clears throat> Once there was a squid who fell in love with the sun. He'd been a strange squid ever since he was born. One of his eyes pointed off in an odd direction, and one of his tentacles was a little deformed. So as a result, all the other squids made fun of him. They called him kimpy and stupid and lame. And when he'd come around, they'd shoot jets of ink at him and laugh at him as they swam away. So after a while, the squid gave up and started hanging out by himself. He'd swim around alone near the surface of the water, gazing upward, and that's when he saw the sun. The sun looked to him like the greatest thing in the world. It's just so beautiful, he'd think, and he'd stretch out his arms and try to grab hold of it, but the sun was always out of reach. What are you doing, the other squids would say when they saw him grasping for it like that. Nothing, he'd say, just trying to touch the sun. God, you're such an idiot, the squids would say. Why do you say that, the squid would ask. Because, the others would say, the sun is too high. You'll never be able to reach it. I will someday, the squid would say. And the other squids laughed, but the squid kept trying. He didn't give up. He reached and stretched and reached. And then one day, he saw a fish jump out of the water. I should try jumping, he said. So the squid started trying to jump to reach the sun. At first, he couldn't jump very high. He'd lurch out of the water and then fall right back in. But he kept trying more and more every day. And in time, the squid could jump pretty high. He can make it eight or nine feet out of the water. He'd make a big dash in order to build up some steam, and then he'd leap up with all his tentacles waving. But no matter how high and how far the squid jumped, he never could quite reach the sun. You really are a stupid squid, the squids would say. You really get dumber all the time. The squid didn't understand how what he was doing was dumb, but it was true that he didn't seem to be getting much closer. Then one day in mid-jump, he saw a bird flying by. Wings, I need wings, the squid said. So the squid set out to build himself a pair of wings. He did some research into different kinds of materials. He found some ancient books in a sunken ship he discovered, and he read the ones about metallurgy and aeroscience. And in time, the squid built himself some wings. They were made of a super lightweight material that also had a very high tensile strength. He'd had to build a small smelting plant to make them. Looks like these wings are ready to go, the squid said. And he leapt up out of the water. And he flapped and he flapped and he rose and rose. He rose up above the clouds and flapped on. It's working, the squid said. He looked up toward the sun. I'm coming, I'm coming, he said. But then something happened. His wings stopped working. Up that high, the air was too thin. Uh-oh, the squid said. And he started to fall. He fell all the way back down to the sea. Luckily, he wasn't hurt. He'd had the foresight to bring a parachute. He even had a backup for emergencies. But he splashed down in the water, and as he did, his wings shattered. And of course, the other squids laughed again. When is this squid ever gonna learn, they said. But the squid no longer took notice of them. You see, the squid had had an idea all the way up there at the top of his climb, just as he was perched at the outer limit of the atmosphere. What I need is an interplanetary spaceship, he said. Because at that very moment, the squid had finally grasped something. He'd finally understood the layout of the solar system. 
before he'd been bound by his terrestrial beginnings. Now he understood the vast distances involved. Of course, building an interplanetary spaceship was complicated, much more complicated than a simple set of wings. But the squid was not discouraged. If anything, he was excited. It's good to have a purpose, he said. So the squid set out designing himself a spaceship. The body was easy. It was the propulsion system that was hard. He had to cover about 100 million miles. I'm going to need a lot of speed, he said. At first, the squid designed an atomic reactor. But it turned out that wouldn't provide power enough. He'd gotten pretty heavily into physics by this point. I need to harness dark matter and energy, he said. <laughs> and so the squid did. He designed and built the world's first dark matter and energy reactor. <laughs> it took a lot of time and about a 1,000 scientific breakthroughs. All right, he said, that should be fast enough. And finally, one day, the squid's interplanetary spaceship was built and ready to take off. The squid put on his helmet and climbed up inside. Well, here goes nothing, he said. He pushed a single button and took off in a burst of light and plowed straight up out of the atmosphere. He tore free of Earth's orbit and whizzed past the moon, burned past Venus, and sped on toward Mercury. There in his command chair, the squid stared at the sun as it grew larger before him on the screen. I'm coming, I'm coming, my beautiful son, he said. I'll finally hold you after all this time. But as he got closer, something strange started to happen, something the squid hadn't foreseen. The ship started getting hotter, and then hotter and hotter still. Why is it so hot, the squid said. You see, the squid really knew nothing about the sun. He didn't even know what it was. It had always just been a symbol to him, an abstraction that filled a hole in his life. He never even figured out that it was a great ball of fire, that is, until this very moment. But now the truth finally dawned on him. That thing's going to kill me, he said. He slammed on the brakes, but the ship just kept on going. He threw the engines into reverse, and they whined. But still, he kept going, getting closer and closer. I'm stuck in the sun's gravity, he said. He did some calculations and realized he was lost. He'd gone too far. He was over the edge. Even with his engines all strained to the limit, he had only a few hours to live. And as he sat there in his chair, just waiting to die, something even worse started to happen. The squid started ruminating and thinking about his life. Oh my God, he said, I really have been an idiot. <laughs> Suddenly it was all just painfully clear. Everything he'd done, all his work had been for nothing. I'm a moron, he said. I wasted my whole life. That's not true, you built me, the ship said. And the squid thought about it, and he realized the ship was right. But you'll be destroyed too, he said. Yes, said the ship, but I have a transmitter. If we work fast, at least the knowledge can be saved. So the squid started working like he'd never worked before, feverishly as he fell into the sun. He worked out all his knowledge, his equations and theorems, clarified the workings of everything he'd done. And in the moments left over, the squid went even further. He pushed out into other realms of thought. He explored biology and psychology and ethics and medicine and architecture and art. He made great leaps. He overcame boundaries. He shoved back the limits of ignorance. It was like his whole mind came alive for that moment and did the work that millions had never done. And in the very last second before his ship was destroyed and he himself was annihilated completely, the squid sat back. That's all I got, he said, and the ship beamed it all into space. And the knowledge of the squid sailed out through the dark, and it sped its way back toward Earth. But of course, when it got there, the other squids didn't get it, because they were too dumb to build radios. <laughs> and the story would end there, 
with this great sad and lonely death. But luckily, those signals kept going. They moved out past Earth, past Mars and the asteroid belt, past Jupiter and all the other planets. And then they kept going out beyond the solar system, out into and through the darkness of space. They moved through the void, through other galaxies and clusters. They kept going for billions of years. And finally, one day, untold millenniums later, they were picked up by an alien civilization, just a tiny backwards race on some tiny backwards planet, all alone at the darkest end of space. And that alien civilization decoded those transmissions, and they examined them and took them to heart. And they started to think, and they started to build, and they changed their whole way of life. They built shining cities of towering beauty. They built hospitals and schools and parks. They obliterated disease and stopped fighting wars. And then they turned their eyes towards space. And they took off and spread out through the whole universe helping everyone, no matter how different or how far. And their spaceships were golden and emblazoned with the image of the squid who spoke to them from beyond the stars. All right, I'm starting to get it. Um, let nobody say that we don't do science fiction here. <laughs> Let's take uh, 6.5 minutes and I'll get a drink. Are you going to time this? Hmm? You going to time this drink? Yeah, okay. it's already going. It's running. It's running. <laughs> okay. And then uh, come back and we'll deal with both of these deal with very us. interesting authors. Yeah. To find out how you can attend SFNSF, or to see the upcoming schedule readings, go to sfnsf.org. Or you can follow the event on Twitter at SFNSF Events and on Meetup under SFNSF Events. The most interesting part of the evening where you bedevil the authors with questions that they will have ready-made answers for, but it will be fascinating nonetheless. So prep your answers and uh, join us back with uh, Cecil Castellucci, Ben Laurie, and Terry Bisson. Thank you. I'm, I'm here. Well, that was interesting. I, I would just like to throw out a thought to sort of guide the discussion that um, you're dealing, to me, you're dealing with why, I'm not sure I would call this why, you're not dealing with a different demographic as, well, partly you are, but you're dealing with a different mode, a different, a whole different mode of literature. And uh, not always in why, some why is quite realistic, you know, and very, um, you know, uh, like, modern post-carver literature. But uh, in both of these stories, one which was, uh, one which was science fiction and, and another in Ben's, I think, it was certainly almost like a science fiction sock turned inside out. <laughs> the, um, uh, but was certainly about science fiction. You know, I think that's what the, uh, so I don't know, I would just uh, appreciate, I, I just wonder what other people think of that. I mean, this is not, um, it's not the usual kind of thing we always do. So I thought it'd be sort of interesting to look at it. Um, it's a bit of a departure for us, you know. Well, one thing I think is so interesting about Ben's work is that, you know, it's very, very sophisticated. I wouldn't call it young adult at all, but I would call it a, a true, the true meaning of all ages because I really feel like it's got that, 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 um, that fable-esque kind of like, let me tell you a story um, kind of vibe to it, but it's extremely sophisticated and, and many of your stories can go very dark, you know, um, and, and I, I always find that really interesting because I, I feel like it inhabits this, this sort of interstitial narrative space because of that. Well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> if, if indeed that was a compliment. Oh, it was. 
<laughs> it was oh, a it compliment. Wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> nah. I, was, I was thinking actually that both the first and the last stories. Oh, that the first and the last stories that Ben did had using science fiction and fantasy as a as a sort of delivery mechanism for sort of magical realism because they, they had that feel to them even though that's not really what they were and that's something I really like and uh, and I felt really you know really wonderful uh, stories to hear re hear read aloud so that was that was sort of just the point I wanted to make with that and the, and the second one was just fun <laughs> I just really liked the way it went so yeah Oh, yeah, just shortly. My take is that the first two would be fantasy, and the last one was kind of a science fiction fable. Well, and then Cecil's story was a was science fiction in the, in a certain sense. It had all these different races and stuff. But to me, there was no um, pretense of realism in it. It was completely... It was. Um, you mean like hard science, like hard science? Yeah. 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 I mean, I would say that it's science fiction, but it's not. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Ha it has more of a basis in heart than it does, like quite actually, than um, than in than in science. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, I don't know. Had, I, I, I'm sort of interested in discussing what makes it different. I mean. And, and I think you see more of the, the I, to me, I see more of the chasm in, in bends in the sense, I mean, how is time hang, handled? How is individual, individuality handled? That is, you know, I was noticing in your stories that time is always time past, time past, time past. This is like once upon a time. You know, there's no, it, it's a way of, if you say time past and time past, you're, you're saying, there's no time, <laughs> you know. So, I don't know. I, I just thought it was a, a, an interesting way of, it's, not, it's nothing new. It's an ancient way of telling a story where you don't embed it in the real world. What was the, um, I don't know. I, I just uh, to me, it's a, it's a somewhat different mode of fiction, and that's what I was thinking about. I was, I was thinking about this because um, I taught a science fiction class one time, which you talked about, and, uh, and so you deal with the golden age dudes and ladies of this and that and the other, and then there's Bradbury, and Bradbury always never quite embedded it in the real world in the way that you were supposed to. And he, it was like a lottery that he won. It wasn't like a lot of people were doing it in those days, you know. I don't know, what do you think about it? You're, you've got a quote from Bradbury, you've obviously, there's something about his way of doing things that appeals to you. Actually, I'm not. I, Bradbury was never a really a big influence. Uh, I was always a big Charles Beaumont fan. I mean, it's really Twilight Zone. It's all just, for me, it's all just the Twilight Zone. Um, Bradbury, I kind of came to later, and, and I find Bradbury really inspirational to read. Whenever I am stuck, I can't write, I read a little Bradbury and like halfway through the story, I'm like, okay, I'm ready to, to write something now, <laughs> you know? Um, Rather than finish the story. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, and, and then, or go watch his speeches on YouTube, like every time he talks, it's amazing. Um, when I read Bradbury, there's always like, the imagination is amazing and the emotion is amazing, um, but he always has that, the golden hue of nostalgia, which I can't, I can't handle it for too much. Like it, it grates on me after a while. Um, I know that's that's a harsh thing to say, but so I take him in small doses and and sort of run run with him. But Charles Beaumont, I think, it did everything that Bradbury did, but darker and and scarier. Huh. I think for me, like for for Tin Star, one of the um, one of the books that I read when I was young that I just kept taking out of the library over and over again was um, Citizen of the Galaxy by Heinlein. And so that I think Tin Star and Stone in the Sky 
um, were sort of my, uh, you know, not homage, but like my sort of tip of the hat to, um, to that particular book. Um, because for me, that was sort of like what a science fiction book was. It was like there was a galaxy and there were like, you go on a ship and you go places and, and stuff. And so, um, and so that was sort of like where I wanted to start out with my thing. But I think for me, Bradbury and that nostalgic kind of vibe was always like, that was always sort of in my, you know, sort of got into my core. Hmm. Yeah, I think I, I come from horror more from, yeah. than from science fiction. Yeah. Well, that, that puzzles me. Look, uh, <laughs> and you took this uh, class with Etchison, right? Yes. Uh, because it seems to me like horror, ha for horror to work, it has to be very deeply embedded in the real world, like the pebbles and the leaves and the sticks and stones of, because otherwise it's not, um, uh, that none of that seems like horror to me. It seems almost like uh, more like uh, philosophical stories that, that are not. Well, you know, it's like Stephen King. I think said that he's. I mean, there's a lot of other people who've done it, but he's made millions do it. Which is you, you create first the quotidian ordinary world with the Seven Eleven and and everything, and then you introduce the horror. It has it. it so that's how I see horror as, as working. But I think like Death and the Lady, like I think Death and the Lady, uh, you know, if it's, it's the way that you couch it is in such a charming sort of like, you know, oh, I'm Death and I'm the Lady, you know? And I say that with love, not with like any, you know? Um, but, uh, but I mean, it's really horrifying. Like, you know, like, uh, you know, the ending is scary. It is, you know, it, it is, it's like, it's like you're looking at it from this way, and so it's like, so we can see that we can see its charm, and we can see the love in it. But it's like if you were to just like twist it that way, I mean, it's a it's a frightening story. So I think that there is a lot of horror in Ben's stories. Okay, uh, then <laughs> then scare me, right? Well, it's a trick. It, uh, it's it's a tradition. It's the dance macabre, the 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 the, the woman and, and death, the, the duet, and, and and that's a classical fable. And both of your stories were lovely, wonderful, interesting um, fables. They they both had, uh, of course, in your case it was a girl fable, and in your case it was a a squid. Okay. Fable, <laughs> what can I say? Oh, you got a girl you know. squid. Mine was an insect, <laughs> but yeah. But, uh, anyway, yes. Oh, and Ray Bradbury did write Twilight Zone. I sing The Body Electric. Um, so, I, and I think it's available, you know, so that might give you, check it out. Check it out. <laughs> I guess I don't mean that it's like horror, but I guess I can see... I can see the flavor, the spice of horror in Ben's work. Yeah, no, I can. I was just looking for the, the difference, you know, because you don't give people names. Sometimes I do. You know, if people say their names, but yeah, yeah not usually, I guess. But there's a way in which you you um, you you avoid the quotidian, which I think is part of the. It's part of what you, and I'm not saying it's totally conscious, but it's how you, it seems like how you work. You, you don't want you, you don't want to touch the ground so much. You want to be somewhere like that. Yeah. I mean, I was always, well, first of all, I, I came to writing stories from writing screenplays. And when I first started writing stories, they, I was just, I thought that I was just kind of piling up ideas for possible screenplays. So I was writing them very quickly and very sketchily, you know, just getting the ideas down. So I didn't name anybody at first because I would get to that later. You yeah, know? right. And then after I did it for a while, I just liked them as stories, and then it was just the style that I stuck with. So it was all kind of accidental. Now, what screen? Were you writing screenplays on spec? Were you revising? Were you working for a still? What were you doing? Um, we I had a writing partner, and um, I mean, we all we did assignment work. So you know, producers would be like, "We need someone to adapt this crappy book. Who wants to do it?" And then, 
And then like 900 people would go in and you'd have to like talk them into letting you adapt the crappy book. And then you'd go home and you'd write your crappy screenplay out of the crappy book. <laughs> and then and they pay for it and then you bring it in and then they say, thank you, this is terrible. Uh, and then we'll so get, they just, and somebody then, else does. And then you move on to something else. Yeah, so how long know. did you guys do that? Like seven or eight years. Yeah? Yeah. And you're both guild writers, right? Were, yeah, I'm not anymore. Like, yeah. uh, not quite, yeah. Uh, but it was mostly revisions or second drafts or adaptations? It was mostly adaptations. There was an original one and we sold some things on ideas that we actually never did anything with anyway. It's a terrible time. No, I'm just um, curious because, you know, yeah. it's Hollywood and I know a couple of people that have done this kind of stuff and, and uh, They have my respect if they make it work. <laughs> <laughs> so it uh, Yeah. But never so it never caught your imagination. You never got one. No, we never got anything made. I find it very difficult. You know, my instinct obviously is to make things short and to sort of I like to take them seriously, but also sort of make fun of them as they go. Um, I am, it's, you have to do exactly the opposite when you write a screenplay. You have to draw everything out. You have to pump up the drama in every scene. You have to nail down the reality of every situation. I've, it's just like you take everything and make it as prosaic as possible. And it just took all the fun and immediacy out of it. And also, I was just no good at it. So it was just, it was just bad all around. We, we did, get, we got into all the right rooms, you know. We just never did very well. I can't blame it on anybody else. Now you worked with Jody Foster a little bit. Yes. What was that like? We never met Jody Foster. We just worked for her underlings, um, and she bought the first thing that we sold. And then we wrote it and we handed it in. She was supposed to direct it and then we handed it in. And she was like, this is great, but I don't want to direct it. I was like, okay. But you got paid for it. Yes, and she sent us a nice bottle of wine for Christmas. <laughs> it's funny, I worked for Jodie Foster too. For a, I was working with a, a, a director that, a young female director that she was very interested in and so she, um, and so that director, not, I never met Jodie Foster, but the director, she hired me, and so we would spend time trying to think of stories and doing up treatments to send to Jodie. And of course, she never liked any of them. <laughs> but, she quit making pictures entirely pretty soon after we got fired. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that was our fault. But. Who knows? Who knows? So your career has been entirely books. No, comics. I write comic books. I write librettos for operas. Uh, I've written indie rock songs. I've done performance art. Cecil does oh, that's everything. right. You were in. You've done. You've also done improv. I did improv. Yeah, and you're that was one like, of the nerdy girls. Uh, yeah, well, that's right. I was a nerdy girl. Yeah. No, I like to. I always say that. Like for me, I fell in love with stories very young when I saw Star Wars. That, that was the moment. And, um, uh, Star Wars? Yeah, Star Wars. What's that, like a Every, movie? Or? Yeah, it's a movie. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very obscure, independent movie. Okay. Done by a guy named George, who I think lived in this town. Okay. And um, I, uh, so I saw that, and I knew that I wanted to tell stories. And right. at some point, I sort of realized that, um, you know, visual artists, they can sort of go on a picnic, and they can bring, you know, watercolors, or charcoals, or pencils, or, you know, uh, whatever, pastels. And the way, the tool that they pick up sort of, um, you know, is, is, the, is the flavor of the picture. And I thought that that was kind of the same thing with narrative, that like, the, depending on the way that you tell the story, you know, comics or a song or opera or a film or whatever, that, um, that it's sort of the same way. It's like picking up a different pencil. And so I just sort of decided that I was gonna dedicate my life to telling stories. And it happened to be that I started off in punk rock and then, um, and you know, and then I, I made a feature film. I did one once. <laughs> I made one. It's a small, obscure film that nobody ever saw, but I did it. I did it. It's called Happy is Not Hard to Be. I had this, no, it's not online because I don't have music clearance, but um, 
is basically what happened was that at one point, um, I, me and my a couple of friends and I, uh, uh, we lived in Hollywood, and you know everyone was saying, "Oh, we want to make movies. We want to make movies." And um, you know, they, these two gentlemen, they weren't actually making movies. So we started a film club at the Echo Park Film <laughs> Center, which is this sort of cool little um, uh, Super Eight film place. And um, so what we decided to do was uh, we decided that we would uh, put a, 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 a random word and we would put everybody's name in a hat and, and everybody would pick someone's name out. You'd have f um, five days, you'd have a week to write a script based on the phrase and then, um, and then you had to give your script to whoever's name you got in the hat, right? So, um, and then you had to make, idea. and then you had to make a five-minute film based on that person's script. And we did that for three years, and um, and it was every six weeks, and it was amazing because what I discovered was that uh, everybody thought that the script that they wrote was the most brilliant script that had ever been written, and Imagine everybody that. thought that the script <laughs> that they got was the worst piece of crap ever. <laughs> and so, um, so it was really all about sort of letting go of your work and being inspired by work and trying to find the heart of work and I think it was like the best sort of narrative school that I got because it you know it like when you would see someone take your precious little script and like have like nothing is you know nothing <laughs> nothing was there anymore you were like what that's not even what I wrote it kind of got you thinking about like how to let go of things and how to really sort of dig deep with story and so I decided after the end of these three years that I wanted to make a longer piece. So I, um, I got 10 actors that I knew and I gave them each two questions and I wrote a script based on their answers and then I workshopped the movie and then I made a, a feature film. And it's, it's pretty good. I just, we had the 10th anniversary of it and, um, at, at the Echo Park Film, film Center and I watched it and I was like, I, I would not turn this off if I were in a hotel room. I would, I would, I would keep it on. Um, so yeah, so uh, so I'm very interested in sort of telling stories and accidentally telling stories in new forms, which is why like when I got asked, uh, oh, would you like to write an opera? I was like, well, yes, I would, even though I don't know what I'm doing. But now I'm doing my second opera. The first one I did was a live comic book opera. And, um, and the new one that I have coming out in 2018 is a film noir hockey opera. So for all you hockey, hockey noir hockey, hockey uh, noir fans out there. Oh. <laughs> um, Boy, you punched my butt yeah. with that hockey noir. So, yeah. Uh. And then, you know, comic books is a different way. Of, and I find that each medium, each way that I learn to tell a story, it, it sort of enhances the thing that I, you know, is sort of the, 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 the wide lane that I write in, which is novel writing. It's sort of each time that I diverge, um, it sort of helps me to become a better novel writer. That's fantastic. So the, the Echo Park thing really worked for you because you learned to let go of stuff. Yeah, let go of stuff. Amazing. You never learn that, right? No, I don't learn it. <laughs> I just keep stumbling around. Yeah, I, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Great. Um, where, where and when was the comic book opera performed and are there videos of that? And then uh, second question, do you know, know of Trina Robbins? Oh who yeah, lives up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah. the grand dame. Yeah, she's the grand dame well, of yeah, comics. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, I suggest that you meet her. I've, I think I was on a panel with her last, not this year, but last year at Comic Con. Oh, really? you were. Yeah. You're always at Comic Con. Yeah, I'm always right? at yeah. Comic Con. Um, the the comic book opera. It's called Les Aventures de Madame Merveille. It's in French. Uh, it was commissioned by a, a Montreal opera company. Um, it was performed in 2009 and then remounted in 2011. Uh, if you're interested, you can email me and I will send you a link to a secret, a secret website with a secret password <laughs> that has the opera, but fair warning, it's in French, so, you know. You now, know. Your, Cana your French is pretty uh, good. Yeah, French-Canadian, so. Yeah. Well, is that your first language? Yeah, it was, but then I went to school in America. And yeah, no, I understand, but, but you're actually French-Canadian. Yeah. Uh, wow, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I think it was just answered, but I was going to ask, did you write it in French or was it translated? I wrote, I mean, I don't write French very well, so I wrote it, so the way that I work with my composer, this guy, Andre Richtig, is that uh, I write it in English, I translate it into my bad French, and then he and my mom fix it. <laughs> Go, mom! <laughs> um, so, but this new, the new, the hockey opera one, we have like four different characters 
And because we're dealing with Montreal, where it's a bilingual city, we have like a, one character that speaks English, one that speaks Franglais, which is French English, one that speaks French, one that speaks slang French. So, so there's a lot more sort of um, there's a lot more sort of uh, stuff that Andre is doing with the translation. So, are you connected with Montreal artistically these days? That there's still a connection there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's. Are there tiles? Are there tiles? Oh, the secret thing. And there's super. The super titles are in French because in uh, it was a French production in Montreal. The secret, um, yeah. Johnny. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the titles are in French. <laughs> but the music so is beautiful. Fun, as I'm sure you know, there's so much funding for the arts in Canada. Yes, they're they're getting rid of a lot of that. But yes, there is. But Trudeau, but our Justin, he's bringing it back. <laughs> Justin, who is shirtless wonder, is bringing it back. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, but I mean, that is all the sort of extracurricular stuff that I do. But like, you know, but I'm really, you know, I, I love writing novels. And I, and I, you know, I, I was always, a, I always wanted to write science fiction. And I was frightened because it was, you know, sort of this thing that was so amazing to me that I was like, oh, I, I don't want to do that because I'll, maybe I'll mess it up. So it took and me a gas, long time. Mostly, it's mostly gas, right? <laughs> yeah, but that's what it's like in comics. That's what it's like in punk rock. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's always like, that's what it's like at my Dungeons and Dragons game. So it's like, it's always like that. I'm used to that. So, um, yeah. So that wasn't so much the issue. It was more like I wanted to, I wanted to do it right. And so it took me, it took me, I think, eight books before I got to to actually sort of be brave enough to write one. I love it. You had a question. Um, yeah, quick uh, stupid question for Ben Laurie. Um, actually, I'd like to ask two short, dumb, deceptively simple ones. Um, first of all, I feel like you have carved out your own sort of form in the super short story, and I'm curious how you settled on, you know, sort of that length range, you know, how you settled on the super short story. And, and a related question, I love the way your endings sort of untangle everything at the end, and I wonder if you know what the ending is going to be from the beginning, or if you sort of discover it in the process of writing. Um, no, I never know what the ending is going to be, ever. Every now and then, somewhere in the middle, I start to get an idea of what the ending will be, and then that's always wrong. I've learned over time. When, I think like when you I mean, the way I write a story, okay, um, I spent a lot of time where I wanted to be a writer, when I wanted to write, and I could not do it. Like, I had all, there was like all this pressure, and uh, you know, I took all these English classes, and my parents were both English professors, and I grew up learning to like take stories apart, and talk about them, and say what they were about, and what they meant, and it was like this intellectual exercise all the time. And, um, so when I wanted to write something, I would always start from like what I'm trying to say, you know, what does this mean, and then somehow try to encode that into something, and it was like an equation, and it was like this terrible experience, you know, I couldn't do it. And so the only thing that ever allowed me to actually write anything was when I finally realized that to just get rid of everything and not think about anything ever. So when I write a story, I don't have any ideas. I don't know where, I don't even know where it's going to start, let alone where it's going to end. I just sit down and get a blank page, and then I wait for whatever the, whatever the first image is that pops into my head, whatever it is. Or sometimes it's a line of dialogue. And whatever that first thing is, I go with that, and I write that story from the beginning until the end. Um, I take them as like assignments that come. Like, I never say no to anything. Whatever comes, that's what I write. Um, so I don't like judge any first lines. I never throw anything away. I just write it and then deal with it afterwards. You don't revise? Oh, no, I cer certainly revise when I'm done yeah. writing the draft. But I don't think out where it's going to go or, or throw away, away anything. I don't ever say, I don't like that first line. I don't like that idea or whatever. Yeah, I can um, dig it. So, so, you know, I think all of us, that even without your, the intensity of having parents were English <laughs> professors, but we all grew up knowing how to take stories apart, but not how to put them together. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, um, you know, and you have to kind of get over that. Yeah. Oh, and also, uh, 
the length that they are, I, that's just how they come out. I don't, I don't aim for that. I would, you know, I would like to be able to write them longer. But whenever I try to write anything longer, the only way I can think to do that is to add words. And I'm just like sticking in like adjectives and adverbs. It's like terrible. <laughs> well, but you, you work, that, that's when I was trying to start with, you work in a mode that has a length. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it's not uh, susceptible. It, yeah. it, it's not very elastic. No. It's not real elastic. Yeah. And um, because from the very beginning, it's clear that um, we're going somewhere, and we're not going to stop and pee <laughs> on the way. You know, we're just going to go yeah. to the spot. You know, and that's you know, you 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 clearly got that right away. The 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 mode has a you know it has an appropriate length to it. You know, now you talk about novels. Uh, what's the length? But the uh, do you my, regard I, these as YA novels? My novels are all YA novels. And yeah, what's the length of a, a, a YA, a well, YA for, novel is not 80,000 words. It's more like 45, right? Mm, it depends. I mean, have you, I mean, some, some YA novels are, you know, 600 pages, you know? So they're, I mean, mine are not. Well, but, I've heard <laughs> of J.K. Rowling, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, no, but I mean, like, uh, the majority of New York Times best-selling YA novels now are over 600 pages. So I would not say that there's like a hard and fast, oh, they're 40,000 words yeah. anymore. Like that's, that's sort of like what the minimum could be. But I've got a book that's called First Day on Earth, um, which, it, you know, is, um, I mean, some chapters are only one sentence long. That book is only 30,000 words. You know, right. it's, a, it's 135 pages. I mean, it's very, very, very short. I'm a pretty lean, I'm a pretty lean writer. Stone in the Sky, which is the sequel to that, it's like, it's like, it's like the longest book I ever wrote. I was like, oh my God, it's so long. And it's not even that long, you know? So um, I think I'm like Ben, but I'm much more traditional than Ben is, where it's like, it's just like, why would I add more stuff in? You know, it's like, it's like a punk rock song. When the, when the song is done, the song is done. It, that means it's probably under two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, you know. I agree with that. So yeah, so even though mine are longer, they're, they're very lean. For, for YA, I think. No, they're quite lean. Yeah, yeah no, I, and that was, that was one of the things I was trying to get at. I mean, what we had tonight is a kind of literature that's a lean. It doesn't, it doesn't tarry. It doesn't, yeah. um, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and some literature, that's the pleasure of it, is the terror. Absolutely. You know, uh, but this, what you guys are doing is, that's not what it's about. It's more about, um, I don't know. Running. <laughs> yeah, or loping along. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, being economical. You know, getting to the to getting to the core, rather than putting too much fat on it. Yeah. You know, not that there's anything wrong with you know with like with like um, a, a tearing yeah like yeah. a tearing book because I love I love wandering like that, but I don't want to write wandering like that. <laughs> yeah, because it's too much work. <laughs> well, to read as well as write. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's more and more plot driven than mood driven or deep uh, analysis of the character driven or um, so. We have different moods, right? You have different moods as a reader too, right? Sometimes you want to like, you want something that's like this thick and just like get right in there and then sometimes you want something that you can just like read in you know an hour in the tub with a glass of wine and that's it you know so uh, yeah, not everyone not everyone writes novels and as far as I'm concerned that's wonderful science fiction has a wonderful long tradition of of short of short story writers including Ray Bradbury and Charles Beaumont and all, and all of these people the Twilight Zone writers and, you know uh, short stories are very much um Part of the fabric of science fiction. It's not all about novels and science. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, you're, I think your writing is more influenced by Charles Bowen. It has that little nip at the end. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Madeline? Here's that we have another professional writer in the world that deals with all this. 
She deals with all this stuff, maybe not daily, maybe not even weekly, but you have to deal with it. Yeah. I don't, what do I think about what, Terry? <laughs> Anything in particular? Literature. Liter I'm in favor of it. You are. <laughs> <laughs> the more the better, and the, the more diverse the better, and the weirder the better. All right. All right. And Kendra, you're a writer. What do you work? What do you do? I've done some fantasy and sci-fi. Yeah. What's the difference between the two? Uh, one, has, <laughs> one has unicorns and one has nanobots. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I just thought of, I don't know, I, I'm not being very clear tonight, but I, I just, I was so delighted with this, both these readings, and, and uh, I mean, I like a lot of modern science fiction, and, and these guys are not really part of that world, but they draw from it and touch on it and enter into it and stuff. It, it was just, it was unique to me. I and, feel like I'm part of that world. I, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm right in there. I, 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 All right. With, with, with some of this stuff, I, that was definitely feeling space opera to me. I was hearing other other alien races, you oh, know, no, spaceships, but, you know, space station. That yeah, know. there was some Deep Space Nine going on. Yeah, yeah that was. I mean, it, it wasn't hard science in there, but it was definitely that felt very much like much more traditional science fiction than. No, it did, and and there is definitely space opera is a recurring theme that comes in. But I felt a lot, a, a lot of yours was like explicit sex. I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, the whole beginning of the story. What was the premise of the story? Size matters, you know. That, oh, no. <laughs> wasn't that what it was about? Did I miss it? Oh, I think, I think, I think we're going to have to agree to disagree on that. I mean. <laughs> Maybe I missed it. <laughs> well, I, you know, I, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> but you know. Well, we all learned something here tonight. I think we did. I think, I think, you know, maybe it's because I'm so small that size matters. Well, I mean, I tur uh, he turned her over on her stomach and opened her back, oh. and there was her heart. And no, her no, head. that didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> It was a, it was his brother who wanted to stab his heart. There was no there was no there was no lady lady man insect turning over and Well there was definitely a rape scene. Sort of. Okay. <laughs> anyway, no, it was uh... I mean right. it was a sibling rivalry scene. Who's that? Oh Sorry. please. Yeah, really. <laughs> okay, so super quick comment on Ben's work. Um, you know, the first time I heard of your work was in a like a short story class. Um, one of the assignments over the ten week course was to figure out what genre it was, and we did not succeed. So that discussion can go on like infinitum, <laughs> just so you all know. Um, and then Cecil, I wanted to. Um, it's not really a question exactly, but I wanted to compliment you on the way that you've described the characters. Um, given that they're an alien race based on insects, I thought you did a really good job of giving us an idea of how they are built and how they visually appear without getting too too descriptive um, and still giving the reader a chance to kind of like fill in the gaps in their own imagination. And I just wanted to compliment you on how well that was handled. Yeah. No, uh, Charlie, yeah. another pro in the room. Story, which was awesome. Uh, really, really loved it. So that story, you know, telling the backstory of one of the characters from Tin Star and, and Stone in the Sky, was that a backstory you had worked out before when you wrote the novel, or did you have to go back and figure out the backstory? And what was it like kind of filling in this one corner of a world that you'd already written a couple of novels in? Uh, it was, yeah, I didn't, um, I knew that Hecklek, I knew that Hecklek had a scar under his wing. And, um, and I knew that, that he had been betrayed and that um, he could never go home. And so when, um, you know, because uh, uh, the book came out on Macmillan and Tor is part of Macmillan, um, they said, hey, if you want, you can write a short story um, and maybe Tor will publish it if it doesn't 
suck. And um, <laughs> so, so I thought, well, what could I write? Like, what you know, what could I, like a lot of like the YA writers on um, Macmillan would. They write sort of these 1.5, you know, stories that, you know, these sort of little novellas. And I thought it would be really interesting. This character is really important. And it would be really interesting to sort of find how he goes to the station. Because, you know, the station is a space station where there are all these people. And it's kind of like the backwater. Like, nobody wants to be left at this space station. So it was kind of a way to talk about how this was sort of the lat, like, like in a Western, like this sort of dusty town that nobody wants to go to or everyone's running away from something. And so I wanted to talk about that. So I didn't have it all worked out. Um, I just knew that it had something to do with this scar in his heart. And, um, and, and so the pleasure was finding out what, what, that, what, what happened. So, yeah. If anybody has an intelligent question, <laughs> not that Charlie's welcome, we will entertain it. Otherwise, our readers tonight, our writers tonight, have uh, books to sign. And um, so let's do that. And thank you all for coming. Robert Silverberg, let me tell a story about Silverberg. <laughs> this series was kicked off by Robert Silverberg. He was our first, our first uh, uh, SF and SF. And I remember somebody, um, who was about 45 or 50, said, um, well, your stories, I read your stories when I was a teenager, and they influenced me all my life. And Bob Sil Silverberg said, I was a teenager when I wrote them. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> He had probably the longest career of, I don't know, man on the century, probably of many people in science. Yeah, he'd be up there. He was, he was one of the real old guard with uh, Asimov and Clark and all that. But yeah, yeah, but but he was a fucking kid, and these guys, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that will be not be one to miss. He's he's. Um, an amazing, amazing writer who went through all the changes from, he wrote sort of high pulp to actual uh, serious literature. Anyway, thanks for coming. It's always fun. We'll see you next time. All right. cool. The SFNSF podcast was produced by Marin McDonald, recorded and engineered by Rusty Hodge. Thanks for listening. So, so.